Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today I've got one of those for science type videos that you guys seem to enjoy from time to time. Anyway, just a few days ago now, AMD did release the Radeon RX 6700 XT. And while quite an impressive GPU, it is after all delivering RTX 2080 Ti Lite performance, it's not particularly great in terms of value, but then that is the theme of 2021. When compared to the previous generation model, so the 5700 XT, we're looking at around 30% more performance on average for a 20% increase in price. So again, pretty poor value for a generational leap. That said, in a way it is still extremely impressive, not the value, but rather the performance. When you consider the fact that the 5700 XT and 6700 XT feature the exact same core configuration using the same TSMC 7 nanometer manufacturing process, a 30% performance uplift is nothing short of amazing. Typically, you'd only expect to see gains this large when moving to a newer and much more superior manufacturing process. Like what we saw, for example, with NVIDIA's Pascal architecture, which moved to TSMC 16 nanometer process from the 28 nanometer process used by Maxwell. The newer manufacturing process enabled higher clock speeds, which drastically improved performance and efficiency. With RDNA 2, though, AMD has managed to achieve a very similar thing while remaining on the same process. So, how has AMD achieved a 30% gain on average across our 14 game sample? There are a number of architectural differences between RDNA 1 and RDNA 2. The RDNA 2 cores featured inside the 6700 XT do have a slight IPC advantage, but the geometry performance is worse in discarding primitives, as the 6700 XT is only configured with half the primitive fixed function units when compared to the 5700 XT. That said, RDNA 2 does pack two scalar ALUs per CU, which is twice that of RDNA 1, and that means complex operations are faster. RDNA 2 also supports mesh slash primitive shaders, and that means for future titles supporting DirectX 12 Ultimate, the 6700 XT should pull further ahead of the 5700 XT. For now at least though, the key advantage apart like the 6700 XT has over its predecessor, so the 5700 XT, appears to be down to the clock speed. On paper, the 5700 XT is said to operate at a boost frequency of 1905MHz, whereas the 6700 XT boost clock is 2581MHz, and that's a rather substantial 35% increase. In reality though, the difference is more like 42%, at least that's what we observed when comparing the AMD reference models. Still, the 6700 XT should be clocking at least 35% higher, and we saw on average a 30% performance uplift, so it would seem that much of that gain is simply down to the architectural design that allows RDNA 2 to clock higher. So that's exactly what we're going to explore today by clocking the 5700 XT and 6700 XT at the exact same frequency, as we suspect most of the performance uplift is simply down to the improved clock speeds, and this test will easily prove if that's true or not. For testing, I'm using AMD reference cards, and both are clocked at 1.8 GHz, as I was able to maintain this frequency by maxing out the power target. Clocked at 1.9 GHz, the 5700 XT frequency did start to fluctuate quite a bit, and often dropped down to 1.8 GHz, so I just decided to test there, and it was able to maintain that frequency. And more crucially, both models were able to maintain a 1.8 GHz clock frequency throughout the duration of the test we ran. So this is about as apples to apples as you can get in terms of operating frequency. And of course, while testing, the clock speed was constantly monitored to ensure that both GPUs were in fact operating at the targeted frequency. As for the memory, I've left that stock, as I believe this is the best way to conduct this testing. You might think that gives the 5700 XT an advantage, as the memory bandwidth is 17% higher, thanks to the wider memory bus. But that's actually not the case. If anything, the advantage here is handed to the 6700 XT, as it uses its memory much more efficiently, with better delta color compression, and more importantly, it has infinity cache. Essentially, RDNA 2 can achieve greater frame rates at a given bandwidth. The Infinity Cache plays a key role here. The 96 megabyte on-chip cache functions a lot like an L3 cache on a CPU. This local cache buffers against read and writes to the memory and is much faster than having to work out a VRAM, helping to boost the memory bandwidth of the 6700 XT relative to the 5700 XT. So with all of that said, it's now time to test these two GPUs clock for clock, and I'll be doing so on our Ryzen 9 5950X test system using 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 CL14 memory. All right, let's get into it. 
Well, right away this is quite interesting, though not totally unexpected. In Watch Dogs Legion we're seeing a very similar performance when matched at the same clock speed. Basically, the average frame rates are identical at all three tester resolutions, though the 1% low performance for the 6700 XT was consistently better by a 4-9% to margin, depending on the resolution. The Assassin's Creed Valhalla results are also very close, though this time the 5700 XT was slightly faster at all three tested resolutions, delivering an extra 2-3 FPS. Again, both GPUs did maintain a 1.8GHz operating frequency, so the differences here are down to the changes in architectural design. The F1 2020 results were near enough to call identical as we're only looking at up to a 3% variation in the data. The 5700 XT was a few percent faster at 1080p and 1440p while the opposite was true at the 4K resolution. The Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege results are a bit more interesting. At 1080p the 6700 XT was around 3% slower, which is a negligible margin, but then at 4K we see that the 6700 XT boosts performance by 8% over the 5700 XT, and I suspect this improved 4K performance is due to the Infinity Cache. We're also seeing a similar thing in Shadow of the Tomb Raider. At 1080p, the 6700 XT offers no real advantage over the 5700 XT when matched clock for clock. However, at 1440p, the 6700 XT is up to 6% faster, and then 10% faster at 4K. So again, I believe this is down to the superior memory management. The Horizon Zero Dawn results are pretty even across the board. The 6700 XT was a few frames slower at 1080p, and much the same at 1440p, and then a few frames faster at 4K. Though overall, you could certainly claim that the data is within the margin of error, despite the three run average. Then testing with Death Stranding reveals identical performance between these two GPUs when clocked at 1.8 GHz. We're looking at the exact same FPS at all three tested resolutions. Frame rates in Hitman 2 are also very similar, though again as the resolution increases the 6700 XT starts to pull ahead, albeit by just 2-3 FPS. So in other words, not a lot in it here. Finally we have the Cyberpunk 2077 results and performance trends are again very similar to what we've seen previously. We're looking at identical numbers at 1080p, with the 6700 XT just managing to nudge ahead at the higher resolutions. So there you have it. Pretty quick and easy benchmark that one. You do like to see it. Basically in today's games, the majority of the performance uplift, something like the Radeon RX 6700 XT enjoys over the 5700 XT, is down to the increased operating frequency of the cores. Again, it is quite remarkable that AMD was able to make such a large step forward without moving to a new process node. We knew this was coming, but I have to admit, it's still hard to believe. AMD was quick to announce its goal with the RDNA 2 architecture of achieving a 50% jump in performance per watt over RDNA 1, and that it would be accomplished entirely with architectural improvements, not process improvements. A lofty goal indeed, but as far as we can tell they've done it, with the 6700 XT delivering 30% more performance than the 5700 XT, while reducing power usage by roughly 15%. Then with the next generation of games, we expect the margin between these two GPUs to widen further, in favour of the 6700 XT of course, so that'll be an interesting situation to monitor over the coming years. As it stands though, in terms of performance, the 6700 XT is a seriously impressive step forward, from the 5700 XT, though unfortunately it is almost entirely undermined by a 20% hike in price, but again that's just how things are in the current climate. So we can't just ping the 6700 XT for offering a weak value improvement over the previous generation product. It is great to see that AMD's well and truly caught up to Nvidia for rasterization performance, and with RDNA 3 they are expected to make an even bigger step forward. So this is obviously great news for gamers. Hopefully by then things will have returned to normal, which should see improved availability and then trigger a bit of a price war between AMD and Nvidia, though I'm probably getting a bit too ahead of myself there, a bit too optimistic at this point. Anyway, that's going to do it for this for science type benchmark. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. It's not buying advice, it doesn't change anything about the 6700 XT. Just wanted to see where all those impressive gains over the 5700 XT were coming from. And yeah, for now it looks to be mostly clock speed. Anyway, that will do it. Uh, if you'd like to get more involved with the Hover and Box channel, support us directly, you can do so over at Floatplane or Patreon, so whichever one of those you prefer. Floatplane does often give you uh, early access to content such as this. 
and both will give you access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams with myself. We'll be doing that very shortly, actually. Uh, Q and A's, behind the scenes content, a lot of cool stuff there. So again, if you're interested, check the links in the video description. If not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.